This is Trinity Sunday, um, and I was going to talk about the Trinity because it's a it's one of these confusing things that Christians kind of understand they're supposed to believe, but they don't really understand, and it's not explained well. But given the events this past week, I think we need to push the Trinity aside and look at the rest of the scripture that is... Um, uh, is our lectionary this week. It's the very end of Matthew. Um, one of the differences between Matthew's Gospel and Luke and Acts and John um, and Mark is that Matthew has the disciples going back to Galilee after the resurrection. So um, they, they see the tomb and they're sent back to Galilee. That doesn't happen in the other synoptics. So what we're looking at is the very last bit in the Gospel of Matthew, when the, Gal the, the disciples, all the followers, are back in, um, in Galilee. Now, before I get that, I do want to say I'm not forgetting about the Trinity. Um, if you want to learn more about the Trinity, and I think every Christian should, um, it's going to be in the Bible Studies page on this website. So I will also have a video on the Trinity, so you'll get two for one this week. Um, but getting back to Matthew's Gospel, uh, this week has been challenging, I think, is, is rather a weak word for what has been going on for so many people this week. And um, it's hard to kind of get a grasp of it. I mean, this week we actually saw church property um, defaced by political actions and the authoritarian government in the United States. And we've seen this kind of thing in, in um, countries around the world. We've seen it happen to Jewish synagogues, um, um, Islamic mosques. I mean, it's not an unknown thing, especially for authoritarian governments, but it's really, really odd to have it aimed at Christian places in North America. that That's not normal. So that kind of shocked the world. And the church, the, the left church came out. And it, it was almost like suddenly the media recognized that white evangelical Christians were not the only group of people in North America who claimed to follow Jesus. So with that in mind, that backdrop, I want to go back to the gospel this week. Because in the gospel is the line, go make disciples out of all people. The, uh, the uh, disciples have gone back to Galilee, they've gone um, worshipping, they've gone talking to the authorities, they are uh, together with Jesus, Jesus says, go, go make disciples, I give you all the power in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's where the Trinity part comes in. And then Jesus goes and disappears. And we have no more of that. But the disciples are now given their commission. They're given their instructions about how to go and continue on this ministry. That is not devoted to a human Jesus leading them, but to a triune God directing them as they go forward. That phrase, make disciples of all, is historically problematic. And the reason it's historically problematic is because people through time, through the last couple of millennia, have used that scripture, have used that verse, as a way to force people to being Christian. Now, it probably wasn't done as much as legend suggests, but it was done enough that it was a concern for modern Christianity, which kind of backed away from that, at least the, the centrist and, and, and those on the left, kind of backed away from this concept of make all disciples. And I would argue right now is the time we have to start making disciples, because now the hunger for justice and righteousness is the hunger that Jesus promised to fill at the well, at the table, wherever he was. This is a hunger, a spiritual emptiness that we are uniquely positioned to be able to fill. Especially since our houses of worship have now propelled us into popular media's attention. We don't know how long that's going to be, but right now we're there. So how do we go about making disciples of all people? Okay, well, the first thing is... Disciples of all people is not translated into make them Christian and make them show up at church. It wasn't there. So Matthew's gospel was written around 70, 80, 90 um, of the common era. Christian church, as we know it, doesn't really emerge as an entity 
until a century or two later, as a, as a political respected denomination, um, not till much, much later in history. So we're not talking about go out and put bums in pews. That is not what this verse means. It, it, historically, it can't because it was pre-church buildings. People were still meeting in factories and apartments and on the lakeshore and in uh, other businesses, legal offices, homes, wherever. But they were not meeting in a thing that we could identify as a church building. This was also not about convincing people they had to be Christians or not and suffer the consequences. Because again, Christianity as we know it didn't exist then. These were still reformers, revolutionaries even if you want, who believed they had to change the Hebraic tradition at the time, that they had gone off the rails of the original intent as taught by Moses and Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and all the prophets. So they were a fixing up movement within the wider Hebrew community. So this is not about getting people into church buildings. This is not about getting people to admit they're Christian or to say they are nominally or, or deeply. So go and make disciples of all people. What can that possibly mean if it's not about upping our statistics and our numbers and our in worship services? Think about what a disciple was. A disciple was a follower of Jesus. A disciple was someone who sat with Jesus, studied, understood more, and then taught others. A disciple is someone who had the opportunity to go out and heal. Now, healing and curing are not the same word. And we have to remember that, that there are people who are healed who will never be cured. So we can't mix up those two. But these disciples were given the responsibility to go and share the message of Jesus. And that message included the most profound statement of the time, which is you matter. Person mattering, that their life has value, is a really, really crucial part of the human psyche. And in all the political uprest that we're seeing right now, and, and it's not new, it's just got a resurgence. The, the phrase Black Life Matters comes out a lot, and, it, and there's some who want to douse that and say all life matters. The thing is, we're not looking at all life in our protests. We're very specifically looking at black lives, and we don't have the right, especially white privileged folks, do not have the right to tell a black skinned person or indigenous person, a minority or racialized person, that everybody matters. Because right now all they're hearing is, I matter just as much, so why should you get any special acknowledgement even though you're treated poorly, more poorly than I am by society. So we're not getting into this all lives matter kind of foolishness. What we are talking about though is that individuals matter. And in the first centuries, where fathers had the power of life and death over children, where wives could be executed, where babies were left on the road, where the elderly and the um, uh, ill were kicked out of the family, how profound it was to tell someone they mattered. And Jesus told a lot of groups they mattered wasn't just a universal message, it also was speci specifically aimed at certain groups. Again, not that they excluded other groups, but certain groups had to hear it more. Jesus told prostitutes, you know, just because you're having to sell your body to probably feed your family, you matter. You are important to God. He told tax collectors, who at the time were the most hated members of society, usually people who were had Hebrew heritage who were working for the Roman government. They were seen as collaborators. They were it was corrupt. Jesus still went and said, you know what? Push all that aside. You as a person matter. To the lame, to the disenfranchised, to the widowed, to the orphaned, there was opportunities throughout the Gospels to go and say, you matter. And Jesus did this. And this is the commission that he gave his disciples. Now, on top of that, he gave them lots of ways to do this. Preaching is not the only way. Forced conversion is never the way. 
Jesus didn't involve himself in forced conversion or force anything because part of the relationship, part of the, part of the exchange here with faith development is that we accept it. It's not forced on us. We have to say, yeah, this is something I want. And in the Gospels throughout, Jesus gives us lots of examples of how to be makers of disciples. He gave us the example of getting really, really angry, thrown over tables, grabbing whips. What we see in the media right now is not outside of the way Jesus handled things. It's actually very biblical. Jesus gave us people sitting down and talking. Again, we're seeing that right now, and it is extremely biblical. Jesus gave us walking away when they won't accept you. Again, very biblical. Sometimes you're just not going to crack the nut of whoever you're working with and walk away. Nothing says we have to stay with someone in perpetuity. We have a mission to make disciples. And if people are not going to accept us, we can move on to the next folks who might hear it. And they also, uh, in the Bible, we have the metaphor of planting seeds and growing seeds and harvesting seeds. So even though we're called to make disciples, we might not be there from beginning to end. We might be there just to plant some seeds, and it might take 20 years before those start to come to fruition. It might take another 30 years till they actually have matured enough to be harvested. We don't know. That's not our job. Our job is just to get out there and spread the gospel. So how do we do that now? Because we're isolated at home. I mean, that's number one. Um, there are protests. And at this point in time, it's like, do I go to protest and risk being made ill? Or do I look at it and say, I'm going to be sick and die of something. Do I risk this? I mean, these are real conversations that young people are having and older people as well. And everybody has to make a decision about how they're going to protest. Probably one of the, the most beautiful things I saw this week is um, a meme that said, protesting is a highway and not everybody's in the same line. Some of your protests have to be through artistic means. Some of it have to be through conversation. Some of it are, is through showing up at protests. Some of it is writing letters. There's no wrong way to get involved with change so long as you get involved with change. There's no wrong way to follow the commission to make disciples so long as you're making disciples. And just making disciples is simply talking about it, talking about Jesus, sharing with people. And you know, North America, liberal white Christians have a really, really bad history of not talking to family, not talking to friends. We don't want to offend. We don't want to talk about Jesus when they might not be interested. But the thing is that starvation is now coming to the fore. That level of isolation is pushing it. The level of, of anger and panic around the social changes and upheaval that we're seeing is pushing this spiritual hunger that people have that might not even know they have. And if you talk about Jesus without trying to force them, and that's a big one, Jesus never forced. If you try to talk to people about Jesus without forcing it, you are, in essence, following the commission to make disciples. So how do we do that? And especially, how do we do that and honor some of the things that we're seeing in public? Because Jesus is definitely on the side of the revolution. He's on the side of the men who can't breathe and the women who are burying their children and the young people who have no job and no health care and no prospect and no home and are in desperation. Some of that is protected in Canada because we do have a really good social safety net, but it's not complete. And we've got a lot of communities. Our Indigenous community, oh my, we haven't even begun to rectify the damage that was done to people who were here before the white settlers showed up. So how do we, in good conscience, go about making disciples and honor the fact that everybody matters? and that black people matter and indigenous people matter and queer folk matter and everybody who is marginalized, everybody who is not privileged matters. I'm gonna stop there for a minute because the word privileged 
really doesn't sit well for a lot of older white folk and they're not quite sure what it means. Privilege when you have been raised in the 60s, 50s, 70s often means those who are financially better off. So if you've been born with the proverbial spoon in your mouth, then you're considered privileged. If you have any hardships, any financial struggle, any health struggle, you don't see that as a privilege. So the word really trips up a lot of, um, of white Christians. What do we do with this word? Privilege, as I'm using it, as a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of people demanding fair and equality rights are using it, is not about having a, a golden life and having a perfect life and never having challenges. Privilege simply means that our gender doesn't add to our problems, our skin color doesn't add to our problems, our sexuality doesn't add to our problems, our identity doesn't add to our problems. I'm standing as heteronormative, white, well-educated, English-speaking Canadian woman. I am privileged. I'm not rich. I have health issues. I have other problems. But my privilege is that I get to speak and be heard because no one's going to stop me based on the color of my skin or the ability of my body. This is privilege that we're talking about. And Jesus asked the people of privilege to make a difference. He asked the disciples who were chosen to follow, who in that environment were privileged, and these were not wealthy people either. They asked them to go and do this job. There are a number of ways that we can make disciples, and one of the ways we can do that is speak out. Use our language, use our words, use our position in the church. Not everybody in the church is going to be white and privileged. We've got a lot of people who have ethnic diversity that sometimes they're, they're said, they're told things that are, are not appropriate. I've got, I've got a dear friend who's Dutch, who has the darkest skin tone in her family, gorgeous, gorgeous woman, and has been insulted based solely on their assumption of her ethnicity based on her skin tone. We have the privilege, that's the word, the way to look at the word, we have the privilege of going out and making disciples, of living that commission. Not only saying what is right, but challenging those who say things that are wrong, who say things like, so-and-so doesn't matter, that there's no real issue, that um, racism is a non-issue in this country. We've seen that by some leaders who've had to walk that back this week that gender equality is not an issue, that um, uh, people in the city have it better off than people in the country. Uh, all of these in insults add up after a while as a way of dividing us. Called to be disciples is to bring us back together. So you challenge people on that, and you raise your children on that, that there is nothing that divides us, that we are all siblings to each other. We are all called to make disciples. We're called to be disciples. We're called to bring Christ into the midst of this. Christ was not a nice person in, in the way a lot of people want to interpret Christ now. Christ got angry. Christ challenged Christ got in the face of authority figures. Christ didn't sit there passively and say, well, I don't know, what are you going to do? That wasn't Christ. So be Christ. Get engaged. Make disciples. Follow the teachings. Spend some time this week reading the Gospels. Look at all the different ways that Jesus behaved in public and also with his followers. Find a metaphor that works for you. Find a, um, a method that works for you. And not all methods are going to work in all situations. But take this seriously. Go make disciples, as Christ told us to. Go bring healing and strength. We have the power to do that. Last week, we celebrated the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who propels us into this. If you were called to go protesting, go do it.
If you are called to write letters, go do it. If you are called to call to contact people you haven't contacted in a while, or or you know people who are stuck at home who have very little connection outside of that home, do something about that. You are called to make disciples. So go be Christian. Go and bring Christ to the world.